Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we talk about functions with several variables. And as you might remember, in the last video we have proven the famous inverse function theorem. And now, in today's part 24, I want to show you some applications of it. However, as always, before we go into the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And moreover, as a supporter, you can download additional material with the link in the description. Ok, then I would say, let's start by recalling the statement of the theorem again. We just have two open sets u and v and a continuously differentiable function f. And now for every point where the Jacobian is invertible, f is a local C1 diffeomorphism. So the claim is really natural, around these points we can invert the function and still have a C1 function. Hence this is already useful in the moment we need some inverse functions. For example, you could have an implicit equation with three variables. Maybe let's start simple, let's say we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 1. So you might know, this equation exactly describes the sphere in R3 with radius 1. And now a common question is, can we describe this surface in R3 with a function? In other words, can we reformulate this equation on the left hand side? Namely, we want to do it in such a way that we have a function z of x and y. So this would give us an explicit formula for our variable z. However, this might only work locally. So for example, we could just ask, does it work around the north pole here? So you already see, the inverse function theorem here could be helpful. But in order to apply it, we first need to find the correct function f. And then for this function f, we want to find a local C1 diffeomorphism at the point 0, 0, 1. And now the whole thing can only make sense if the function f sends R3 to R3. In other words, our C1 function here needs three variables as an input. So we have x, y, z for the inputs but we also need three variables as an output. Otherwise our inverse function theorem would not be applicable. Hence what we could do is to leave x and y as they are and the last component could be the actual function we need. This means there we put x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Therefore in the end we are only interested in the case that the last component of the image of f is equal to 1. So we are interested in the pre-image of that, which means the sphere here lives on the left hand side. And there you already see, the inverse function would solve this equation to an explicit formula. And then this part on the sphere can be described by a graph surface. So roughly speaking here, we would have a function z that sends r2 to r. And the graph of this function would live in r3. And to say it more precisely, the domain of z would be just a subset in R2. Ok, so this is the picture and to get it, we have to satisfy the assumption of the inverse function theorem. This means we have to calculate the Jacobian and check the determinant at our north pole. This is not so hard because the Jacobian is given by partial derivatives. So in the first column we have the partial derivative with respect to x which means we have 1, 0, 2x. And the second is with respect to y, which means we have 0, 1, 2y. And finally for the last column, we need to calculate the partial derivative with respect to z. And there we have it, this is our 3 times 3 matrix. And then you immediately see, at our point 0, 0, 1, we have the determinant as 2. Hence our assumption from the inverse function theorem is satisfied. Hence we can simply apply it and find our local inverse function of f. So roughly speaking we could just say f inverse exists locally. And it is also a C1 function which is important if you want to calculate derivatives. 
But first for us, the equation of the inverse function is important. In short, it just means that f inverse of f of x is equal to x. Or by using our three variables, we have x, y, z here is equal to x, y, z. So this is the whole thing, but we can rewrite the left hand side as well. Simply because we already know what f is. So actually what we put into f inverse is x, y and x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And now we also know that this inverse here works for a whole open subset in R3. Hence it also works if we restrict it to our sphere. Hence what we want is what happens if we put x, y, 1 into the inverse function. Because there we know that for each x and y this point lies on the sphere. And by using the equation from the left hand side we already know that we don't change the variables x and y at all. In other words this inverse function gives us the description for the variable z. Or to put it in other words the last line here, the last component of f inverse gives us the function z of x, y. So our inverse function theorem gives us the explicit formula for the function z of x, y. So in general we would say we start with an implicit equation and then we can solve it explicitly for one variable. And now one crucial learning here should be that for the whole argument it was not so important that we work on the sphere. Hence with more complicated equations we could also do the same thing to get an explicit formula. However the problem here might be that the result is only interesting in theory if we are not able to write a simple formula for f inverse. But still sometimes knowing the existence of such a function can already be helpful. Now for this example here you could argue that the whole thing was not necessary at all because we already know this inverse function. In this case it's simply given by the square root of 1 minus x squared minus y squared. This is how we can locally solve the equation around the north pole. So also here it's important to remember that this does not work globally but just around the point. Indeed here you can make it work for the whole north hemisphere. Ok so with that you have seen one concrete example of the application of the inverse function theorem. And if we want to do it in more generality for more equations then we need to formulate a new statement. And this will be the so called implicit function theorem. So you already see how it should work but let's discuss more details in the next video. So I really hope we meet there and have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.